tres. Ok. Hi everyone. Eh, today we're here with Fernando Morán. Es que what's what's how how do you say the last name? Etserski. Etserski. It's, 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 it's Russian it's, descent. Oh, okay. I, th I thought it was Jewish. I th it is. It is. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. Long story, but we could get into detail <laughs> afterwards. So I I wanted to take the time and thank you uh, for for talking to us, Fernando. Fernando and I met in Boston. We both went to school there and. And I know you were from El Salvador, and and since Gold Media Tech is involved in development with Latin America and helping you know young developers, you know work with U.S. startups. I think you're do, you're involved with similar. We're we're you're doing a lot of things for your country and in your community, and I think we we'd love to learn more about that. So for for everyone that's listening, I'm just gonna Fernando. I'm gonna go quickly through your LinkedIn. You, you graduated from Bentley, and then after that, you worked a year. Is, are you a year at Ivy? Correct. After Ivy, you actually became a, a professor in El Salvador, which I find amazing. You know, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty cool to, to be able to teach and, you know, give back. And you also worked at a, a credit company, Sociedad de Ahorro and Credit. And, well, it's... I'm I'm a director there and their innovation okay. committee. Yep. Okay, perfect, perfect. And now, and then I think this is why I wanted to talk to you. You are the co-founder of Seed Community, which I, I mean, I think I've looked at your website and it's, is it some sort of like a co-working space and, and also so it, start, it started as a co-working and then we could, we could go into details how okay. it kind of migrated. Uh, but yeah, currently it, uh, well, originally it was a co-working. I was working in Boston at the WeWork. Mm -hmm. uh, in South in South Boston, and and I found it, fell in love with the concept, how people were collaborating, how people were sharing ideas, how companies came to life literally over a cup of coffee. Um, so I wanted to replicate that concept into El Salvador, and and that's literally what what took me back after seven years living in America um, to go back to El Salvador. And okay, and and let let me ask you before we start, what what were you doing at Ivy like after you were after graduation? Sure thing. So after uh, graduating, actually, I started a company uh, from Bentley uh, mm -hmm. with a with a entrepreneurship professor of ours, uh, Fred Tufili. I don't know if you remember. I I, I, heard, I remember. Oh, okay. it's, it, he had like some chemical comp ke chemical startup or something. Um, weather, weather company that he sold. Or yeah, something. He, yep, he sold the weather app to the Weather Channel. Mm -hmm. uh, but then he was a professor at at Bentley, and uh, he would he would bring all this crazy entrepreneurs into class. And there was this guy, um, a, a doctor in nuclear engineering, who's uh, Dr. Frank. And he had done, you know, this massive sailboats for tanker ships. And it was in a prototyping stage. And that was like my first contact to entrepreneurship. I fell in love with, you know, the, the brilliance of this mind uh, coming into a tangible uh, aspect of it and, and really putting a value to what your mind can create. And that's what uh, led me to, you know, to get in, involved in the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Boston. Uh, we were developing this project, but obviously, as as most startups, um, we didn't have much funding. So we, you know, I, I was working on Ivy Parallel to this a startup initiative, uh, which you know paid the bills. It was fun. We were building communities. We we're creating, um, you know, networking opportunities for professionals who were ready. Was this in also with area. Mr. Truffle? Was this also with Mr. Truffle? No, yeah. no, 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 no. This was this was alone. This was okay. founded by some other folks from uh, Harvard uh, that you know loved their Harvard experience and they wanted to translate that to the world, pretty much. So mm -hmm. it was kind of like a social university they called it, where uh, professionals could meet multidisciplinary professionals, and you know you could be a lawyer, but you could have an artist friend and a biologist mm -hmm. could be in the same room as with a finance guy. So it was you know it was a nice environment, and I guess the combo of you know that part of my life. Uh, being exposed to entrepreneurship, uh, you know, through school uh, where we met, uh, then kind of understanding the power of building community and uh, parallel to that, the power of space and how the design would lead to creating new businesses in a space like we work. I, you know, kind of took that, uh, packaged it into what it is now Seed Community, which was an effort um, that I started with, with two of my founders um, in 2018. And, and let me ask you something. Were you always entrepreneurial? Like, would, as a kid, you always knew you were going to be an entrepreneur or you wanted to maybe, 
Like, was this, is this something where did you start businesses when you were in high school? Cause like, I meet a yeah. lot of, a lot of my friends that are entrepreneurs, like they always had some gigs, maybe they, or, or being, yeah, being, being, uh, as a kid, I was always the one selling, you know, candies on the, on, you know, uh, en el recreo, just with, with friends and whatnot. Um, that kind of gave me a taste of what it was to, to haggle and sell, you know, we would do, um, I don't, I don't, you'll have to help me in the translation, but I said patanas, the one day you like, you would shoot, uh, we'd cut some bamboos and, you know, put in, you know, those pina colada, um, like pineapples that you get to put. Uh, so those were our darts and we would spray paint them and sell them as a, a personal serbatana during school. So, you know, I always had that urge of selling and creating, um, but it wasn't until college that it kind of gave me a wide perspective as to what, um, you know, that the industry would look like, right? Uh, entrepreneurship is, is kind of, for me, it was this vague concept and then um, kind of seeing the, the, the backing of it and, and how it all came to play, uh, that was until college. Fernando, I, I, this is a thing that's a good response and, 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 and I appreciate it. I think a lot of our followers want to know a little bit more about El Salvador and why, why are you decided to start a business in El Salvador? I know you're El Salvador, but you could have stayed in the U.S. And like, what's, what's that connection between the U.S. and El Salvador? Like, what makes El Salvador such a special place for entrepreneurship or if it's super tough? So, you know, I think it has a special place in my heart just because that's where I was raised. I was actually born in America, raised in El Salvador, so it's kind of like the reverse migration. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me personally, it, you know, it was, it's a fertile ground for entrepreneurs to flourish. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why, um, you know, in, in, in some concepts. There's, first, there's this concept in, in El Salvador, and, and I believe in Colombia as well, it's called el rebuscado. I don't think there's a translation, direct translation to English, but rebuscado is people who's always in, you know, in the hustle to find anything, to find anything. the next opportunity, anything just to go by, right? So um, the concept of rebuscado, it's, it's very ingrained in our DNA. Uh, unfortunately, because we, we lack opportunities, we lack infrastructure, we lack a lot of things that obviously Latin America um, in general suffers. Um, but this mentality of finding the next big thing just because we've got to get by our day and feed our family um, ignites that entrepreneurial spirit within the population. So for me, that was a big opportunity right there. Um, the fertile ground as well, also uh, being very backwards in most of our processes, backwards in most of the ways that we approach business. And in our digitalization, we're you know, ranked in one of the poorest um, you know, rankings uh, in a, in a global perspective. So that only translates to opportunities, right? Um, so what I wanted to, to understand was how can I bring, you know, traveling to the future, right? Living in Boston, meeting people like you, people like our friends that we had a chance to, to interact with and having that little piece of the future, how could I bring it back to El Salvador and accelerate a little bit of the process that was going on in El Salvador? Interesting, 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 um, interesting. And in terms of like, for example, an American is, is listening, will be listening to this. Is it tougher to go to El Salvador and start a business? Is it complicated? Like, for example, I lived in Ecuador and I've heard that it's, it'll take you a couple months. You got yeah. to count it to even take a shit. I'm sorry for the language, but, but yeah, like, like you have, it's, it's a very complicated process in the U.S. It's like, 24 hours, you have a company, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and I think that is definitely one of the biggest uh, Achilles heels that our country has is the infrastructure and the um, ability to start a company is very, very hard. That's why most of the entrepreneurs actually work on the informal sector of El Salvador. It's easier, it's cheaper for you. Um, it's more nimble, right? That's a word uh, they, they loved using over there, but it's easier for an entrepreneur to work on the informal side of, of the economy just because they don't have to go through all the regulations and all the processes. So, um, you know, I, I'll be frank with you. I sold my car. Um, I used to have uh, a car in Boston. I sold mm -hmm. it to start my company in El Salvador. That's uh, awesome, man. Three years afterwards. It is awesome. Uh, but then, you know, the reality is that um, after I sold my car and started my business, uh, after three years, I was only able to buy a bicycle, you know? So <laughs> that's the reality <laughs> of, of El Salvador. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's sad, but there is a lot of opportunities still there. I think it's a very, again, a very fertile um, environment for, for uh, startups to flourish. 
though we still have to work on the basis and the fundamentals of, of the country um, in order to be more, you know, more profitable. No, Fernando, and, and, and I, I, I love the hustle, selling your car. I mean, that shows how committed you are, and you're just starting out, so I, I think you'll, you'll, you'll have a, a better car in a while. <laughs> Hopefully, because now I got my bike over there. But, um, you know, jokes, jokes aside, I think it's, it's, it's a country that has a lot of potential, uh, a lot of talent, but also, you know, when you, when you look at, at the market size, right, and I think going into, into the whole business mindset, is it something that you want to sell, you know, you have a solution, you want to sell it to the people in El Salvador or, I, I, or you want to sell it to the world, right? So it's kind of going back to what you've done. You've created an infrastructure in Colombia and your market is the whole world. That works. And those are the successful companies in El Salvador, the ones who work from El Salvador, but for the world, right? And, and having that, uh, I believe can be, or I believe is actually the future of, of the business mentality that, that you're seeing. We used to have it uh, with the sweatshops in El Salvador, big, um, you know, uh, textile industries down there. Uh, we would produce uh, from Fruit of the Loom, Nike, Adidas, all the big brands. Um, and, you know, we pay, we pay cheap. We sell expensive in the States. I don't think that's the model or the future for tech. I believe it's paying very, very well. Uh, but serving the whole world as as your potential market with you know with this new age. Fernando, let, let me ask you something. Now that we're 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 looking at at the U.S. fighting with China, and you know a lot of companies are like, hey man, like I don't feel safe right now having my factories in China. Do you see this as an opportunity for El Salvador, maybe for U.S. companies to to start producing in El Salvador? Is it, it's not that easy. So you already have that. Uh, there's some tax incentives. I think for the manufacturing, uh, you know, industry, it's it's a lot more established. There's there's a lot of international companies that are already have their headquarters in El Salvador. And I'm going to tell you, you know, kind of going back to what benefits El Salvador has. Uh, we're dollarized. So as Ecuador, we were dollarized in uh, the early 2000s. Um, we're central time, which is ideal, right? So a lot of the call centers are in El Salvador as opposed to India, for instance. Um, and also we have a very um, big chunk of our population who's migrated to the U.S. So we have a lot of Americanized, um, you know, from, from accents to culture as well. So the, the people in El Salvador have a higher quality of English uh, compared to the, to the region their centralized time and they're dollarized. So I, th I think that definitely serves to our advantage. That, that, that helps. I mean, it helps. It makes it a little bit more expensive. Ecuador, I think it's, it's a little expensive, like, mm -hmm. but, but it does, it, you know, even if you have like a socialist president or something, it protects, you know, it gives you some sort of protection. I, I, I believe. Okay. Fernando, a, now that you have a co-working space, we, we were also based out of WeWork. All of our mm -hmm. entire team had WeWork offices, and the moment the pandemic hit, we canceled them. Yep. We completely canceled them. But I think that after, now that in Colombia, the quarantine lasted for about five months and you couldn't even leave, leave your house. Mm -hmm. But now I, I really do want to go back to the co-working space. I, I like working from home, and sometimes it's good, but. Dude, I also want to go to a co-working space. And I actually think you're in the right business because I think it's the future. I think you, you want to go a few times a week and you don't want to be tied up to a lease. Like, talk to us about the, the, the co-working business. Like, what are the, the pros and the cons of this yeah. business? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the pros are, you know, are clear. It's a ready-to-move-in space, um, flexible contracts. Uh, you definitely have, you know, community you have shared shared resources, so you get to dilute your operations, right? I think there's two trends that are moving uh, more and more offices to to co-working spaces after the pandemic. One is a downsizing, which is inevitable after a crisis. A lot of the companies are downsizing, um, but also there is a higher uh, demand for you know for for community. I think we're not we've been raised at least generations above us have been raised in the mentality where individual is key and everybody kind of works for themselves um and it was that driving force that that led the economy for all this you know the past decades or, or so where it has been that individual at the center i think uh, we're shifting that and um there is a higher you know higher frequency in in connecting with others there is a higher mentality in collaborating with one another 
So community has taken a little bit more re relevance in the, you know, in, in this modern age. So I do believe co-working tend to, to work towards community on a, you know, makes on a more efficient way. Makes sense. Uh, yes. But to your point on, you know, the cons, obviously being, being a real estate uh, right now, it's probably the worst industry you'd like to be in apart from tourism and, you know, uh, hotels and airlines, yeah. but um, definitely it's been hard. Uh, we've been, uh, locked down more than Wuhan and El Salvador, right? So uh, about five months as well. And you start slowly seeing uh, the opening of, you know, the country. Um, and, and unfortunately, also the co-working spaces, um, you know, you are sharing, you know, the coffee mugs, uh, you are sharing the coffee, uh, you know, the, the, the water filters, uh, you're sharing a lot of other stuff, right, with people. So uh, there might be a little bit more prone to infection, uh, to be honest. Though, I believe, you know, if you have the right procedures prior to coming into the building, you can mitigate some of those yeah. risks. No, so what I, we've done, um, you know, we have a bio unit, uh, which is kind of like a complement to the, the cleaning crew, uh, and they're disinfecting constantly. Uh, they're putting, you know, mats where you can disinfect your, your feet, a hand sanitizer. And I think we learn every day how to deal with this better. So, you know, we'll, we'll have to adapt. We'll I, I, I loved your LinkedIn post. I loved it. The one that you put the other day, uh, I don't know if it was the other day, it was like a month ago. It says, interesting how life works. When you feel you have accomplished your objective and the hard part is over, life answers back with a small smack of reality. Can, I, I loved it because I think, I think it's true. Can, can you share to us a little bit about that? Because uh, sure I think thing. it's key to, to being successful. Um, so I think, you know, obviously life has its ups and downs and, and it, it translates the same to businesses. Um, March was our best month. You know, we, we had been growing for two years steadily. Uh, we started with a small little house in, you know, in a part of the city. Uh, we grew to a second location after the first year. Uh, we grew to the, you know, one of the newest and most luxurious corporate towers in El Salvador on, you know, on, on, on year two. Um, we expanded within that tower because we had completely filled up the 12 floors. Oh, so we wow. took over the sixth floor as well. Uh, we expanded to Guatemala at the beginning of, of 2020. So the business was doing great, right? We were uh, growing. We were, um, we had over 2000 square meters under management. Uh, we had a bunch of offices, more than 200 people that shared our, you know, our ecosystem that we call it. And things are looking very, very good for us. Uh, we have grown the company from zero, you know, to close to a million dollars of sales in, in over a little, a little over two years. Um, but then, you know, this kind of hit us like a smack of reality, right? Whenever we felt that we were an all-time high, uh, in the blink of an eye from March 16th to March 17th, um, what seemed to be the most successful year in the history of the company, which is a small history, we've only been three years at it, um, you know, it, it made a terrible turn for the worse, but um, we reinvented ourselves fairly quickly. We knew that during the crisis, there were two things that I prioritized for my team. One was the retention of 100% of the staff that oh, we wow. currently had, and the other was 100% retention of the clients that we had. Unfortunately, we weren't able to hit any of those two, you know, but you know, we gotta, we gotta shoot for, for the stars, right? And, and expect um, what will happen, but, uh, that obviously uh, we, we changed the business model. So I don't know how, many, how much detail uh, you want me to go into this, but we used to rent. Whatever, and, yeah. whatever you feel comfortable. Yeah. Perfect. But we used to rent and then we'd sublease, right? It was, it was a straight real estate model. We rent directly to the property owner and then we'd sublease to the, our clients. Um, the problem was on March, our biggest clients, uh, international companies, especially started canceling on our lease and we had a small clause, uh, it's called uh, the Forza Mayor, uh, which is, you know, any, any eventuality like this. You, you put it usually happen. as a standard. Yeah, but nobody, you know, you never expect a pandemic to hit, right? Or a terrorist attack or, you know, uh, a natural disaster type of those things. So uh, anyways, they started uh, pulling the contracts from us. And overnight, we had, you know, from uh, our highest, you know, revenue history to, to, to a point where we couldn't even cover the costs of operating the spaces so what we did is we flipped the business around and we made it into a franchise um so what we did was all right listen this is the know-how we've built it for you we've assessed the community for uh you know for over a year 
Uh, we already have a client list for you. Let me give you that client list. And let me charge you a royalty, um, you know, to, to manage still the brand. And we'll give you kind of like the guidelines, the manuals, uh, the operating manuals and, and everything related to running the day-to-day -day business. Uh, but we'll step back because we can't cover those costs anymore. Um, so, you know, we, we ended up franchising. Uh, we ended up closing one of the co-workings that we had in El Salvador. Uh, but then we, we, we were able to franchise the rest. So that was good. We still have that model. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have to let go most of the, um, you know, the, the, the maintenance people, uh, the, the, the team that worked for, you know, the security guards, the receptionist, uh, uh, the cleaning crew. Uh, but fortunate enough, they were rehired by the towers by that we, okay. yeah. so, so we, you know, we had to do that switch. So actually, um, it was, it was fairly good for the team. They didn't lose their job, which was very, very important for us. Um, but also we were able to, you know, to take the company into a different direction. Uh, and that's kind of what led me to the next project where we're doing now, we're focusing on innovation um, as a service, right? So uh, we saw this big void in the market. El Salvador invests a little bit less than 1% in uh, research and development at a nationwide level based on our uh, GDP. Um, so we, we're a country that does not believe, or at least doesn't put the money where, you know, where our beliefs is in innovating and creating new stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that has created stagnation uh, over, over the economy for the last, you know, couple of decades. And typically what you're seeing is just, you know, very lineal growths in, in most of the companies where you're not seeing exponential growths in, in, in any of these companies. And then you have competitors like uh, Airbnb, you know, uh, killing the, the hotel industry in, in five, 10 years. Um, so what we're trying to make people understand is that we are not bulletproof to the realities from the world. You know, El Salvador might be run like a separate country and it might have, you know, we don't even have our own money now, but you know, it, it might be run by our own government and whatnot, uh, but we're not bulletproof to what happens in, in the world. So we got to innovate as well, or we will die. You know, we will die as an organization. So um, that's when uh, we saw the synergies with the IDB lab, which is, oh, wow. um, it's their laboratory uh, for, for the IDB, right? It's, it's, it's the bank of banks, right? It's, 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 it's the big honcho. So they saw also this opportunity to invest in an innovative concept that could uh, digitalize most of the economy in El Salvador, help connect this entrepreneur world that we had already been Kind of positioning ourselves with a seed community because um, the co-workings it's it's only the roof right uh, we attended uh, a lot of entrepreneurs inside of the co-working created events we created communities uh, through through pizza and beer right those are the two driving force for community uh, <laughs> so um you know we had the entrepreneurs kind of identified in you know in the ecosystem um, and also we had identified a lot of the corporates because we were partnering with the biggest real estate developers with the concept of co-workers, right? We were uh, going into the biggest towers, attending this, um, this unattained market. So uh, we started seeing this, you know, that we could be this bridge between the entrepreneurs and the demand that the corporates might have uh, in order to innovate. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very appealing for the IDB lab. They gave us a million and a, and a half um, brands. million and a half. And let me ask you, let me, let me interrupt you right there. Are they, they are, are they partners in the business or is it like, is this like um, so alone? How does it work? No, no, no. So it's a non-refundable grant. Um, they used to tell us this in, in, in college that they exist as non-refundable grants. I thought they were a lie until I got one. Uh, but essentially it's, you know, it's, it's, it's money that they give you uh, to develop a project because uh, the bank, uh, uh, the IDB is, is a development bank, right? So they help uh, Latin America. They're in over. Uh, but do you have to pay this money back or no? No, it were non no, no, it's non-refundable, non-refundable. They give you the I, grant. I need, you to <laughs> I need you to make a connection. I, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's awesome because now, you know, what, what they do is uh, they create a portfolio of different initiatives and our project is, the, the spearhead for innovation in the, in, at, at a countrywide level bet. So what they're doing is they want Sandbox, which is a company that we've created, mm -hmm. um, to lead the innovation uh, in the whole country, right? So um, the project was too big for me to handle on my own. I got to be very, very honest with you. So what I said was, all right, who do I need uh, to create this and, and, and who can help me do this? 
so the way that they work is you give a, they'll give you a dollar, but you got to put in a dollar, right? So they okay. gave us 750,000. We had to put in 750,000 as, as a counterpart. Mm -hmm. Okay. For the, um, so, um, you know, we, we partnered up with the biggest real estate developers in Central America. Mm -hmm. um, and they kind of gave us a counterpart in, you know, in infrastructure, which helps us to build the laboratories because we have uh, some physical innovation laboratories uh, with uh, a fab lab inside which uh, digital fabrication lab from the MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have the license to, you know, to create a fab lab inside. Uh, we also have, you know, different toolkits that, um, the and, corporates can use to and innovate. Fernando, how, how do you plan on like, I, I sort of understood, but how, how do you do consulting? How, how does, how does yeah. you, how do you, so there, there's three quantify. components to the project. Yeah. So there's okay. three components to the project. One is the use of data as a catalyzer for uh, corporate innovation. Uh, so the problem is now data is very, very scarce in Latin America, right? You, you, you probably are very familiar with this mm -hmm. subject um, being, you know, in, in the development side, you see that there's uh, very few companies who are putting out for the corporates to digitalize their economies through our platform, share our data, share their data uh, so we can run programs uh, and use data as a driving force. So that's the first component on, you, you know, you talked about monetization. Uh, the way that it works is corporates pay us to put a challenge through this digital platform. And, and the challenge, what it is, it's a open innovation challenge where you, let's say I'm a corporate and I'm dealing with, you know, maybe I'm trying to reinvent my, uh, my way of, of doing, uh, I'm a, I'm a big law, law firm and I want to do smart contracts. Right. Okay. I think that's, that's, that's a, a very relevant for this time of day. Um, so they have no idea. They're, they're big time lawyers, uh, very good at litigation, uh, very good at their career, but they have no idea of technology. Right. So they have this, challenge where they want to incorporate this new trend where DocuSign is taking over and whatnot. So um, what they will put over this platform ideally is the challenge of digitalizing their process and trying to find out what's the best strategy for them to adapt digitalization in this you know, new DNH. So what we do for them um, is they put a monetary price for that challenge mm -hmm. and we open that challenge for anyone in El Salvador to bid on. Uh, so it could be a guy from the deep jungles, right, of El Salvador or from the coastlines or from the capital or, you know, from, from every walks of life, they can bet uh, to solve this challenge. through. But it has to be El Salvador. It has to be from El Salvador. For now, we are, you know, the, the okay. project itself, it is to fortify and solidify the ecosystem in El Salvador. So. Uh, eventually, you know, if we can't, so, so our logic is if we can't find a solution in house, let's look for the world. Okay. Right. Uh, but let's give the opportunity for our people. So, so that's, uh, one of the issues we're trying to tackle. We, there's a saying, again, I don't have the translation to it in English, but Malinchista, we love shit that's from abroad, right? We love things that have a U.S. brand on. We love shit that's in English. Uh, and we hate whenever somebody from our own country is trying to give us a, an advice or a recommendation. So, uh, we're trying to, to kind of erase that mentality, right? Yeah, it can be good. Uh, and, and we do have the talent to create technology and solutions from El Salvador. So uh, that's why we're trying to tackle that. And once, you know, it's open to the public and let's say uh, in this sense, um, you applied and Danny is from El Salvador and, you know, you have the best idea on how to digitalize because you've worked with a law firm in, I don't know, in, in Boston in order to, to di digitize their whole project. Uh, you'll get that price as an entrepreneur. So you're being bona fide for your solution, but not also that you have a corporate partner to start your entrepreneur with. So we're kind of streamlining the whole process. And that's I love uh, it. really being taken from Israel, which is our, you know, our model in this, in this particular uh, scenario where most of their startups are business to business. Most of their startups are being, um, B2B, yeah, I'm solving a necessity for a corporate. Uh, and, and, and the lack of liquidity that our markets have and the lack of available funds for innovation and kind of going back to the, our, our original conversation where we invest less than 1% in, I, I, uh, in research and development, uh, we want the corporates to start leading the way, right? But we need to streamline the whole process. And we, we don't only have to do the connection, we have to guide them through that process. So that's where... Um, the, you know, the second component of the project takes, takes uh, a little bit more form. It's where we guide these entrepreneurs 
with uh, transfer of knowledge, uh, with programs, uh, with incubators, with accelerators, with, with all the content that they might need in order for them to have a better solution for the corporate. I love it. I love it. I love it, Fernando. And I think, I think you, for some reason, you, you want to help a lot of your community. You, you're very, patro like all, all, everything that you're doing involves, has a social background to it. Like it's not, it's not purely, you know, just to, for the sake of making money. I know it's yeah. important, but, but is there a reason for that? Like, or? Um, I gotta be honest with you. I, I think it's, it's that point where you're so grateful with what life has offered to you that you feel a certain responsibility to give okay. back. Right. Um, so I was fortunate enough to be able to study in America, right. Go to Boston, uh, go to this amazing school, meet people from all over the world, travel, uh, discover, you know, new horizons. And I believe it is my responsibility to give back what I have learned. Okay. Uh, but, and that's why I was a professor in El Salvador, right? So I dedicated uh, about last two years. This year, I was, I was enable to, to be a professor because I, I do sick uh, cycles. So I only do three-month cycles a year. How was it? How was it? Did you get bullied or no? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. It was fun. <laughs> It was fun. I thought I was going to get the karma from, from being a kid because, oh, I mean, I, I, if, if any of my teachers are, are listening in high school, I'm, I'm sorry, but I wasn't, I wasn't the best student. But anyways, um, no, it was, it was fun. It was a great enriching experience. Um, a lot of cool ideas. It was an entrepreneurship course, so it was fun. We, uh, I pretty much replicated a course I took at MIT mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, kind of translated to, to Spanish and, you know, kind of followed the same model from a uh, Bill Outlet, uh, an MIT professor that oh, I wow. had the chance to meet in, in one of those kind of like extra. I think I have his book, you know, I think I have this guy's book. It's the like 24 Disciplined Entrepreneur. Uh, 24 yeah, steps I think I have that book. I have that book. I have that book. Yeah. It's, a, it's a easy to read 24 steps to getting your ideas out into the market, right? But anyways, um, that kind of gave me the, the necessity. But also, and, I, and this is kind of where where I'm taking a step back from, from everything because after the pandemic hit, I also realized um, in order to help someone, you got to help yourself. And, and in the best sense possible, uh, I think one can try to create communities. One can try to, you know, build this ecosystems, but nobody's going to pay you for that. That's, that's the unfortunate reality. Nobody's giving me a dime. Yeah. I'm getting money from the IDB, which is great. Right. So, so I'm dealing with this fund, which allows me to create the concepts or the ideas that I had in mind. Um, but it's not money that, you know, I can't buy my new, my new car with that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I still got to ride the bicycle. So, yeah. um, it, it, it got me thinking, um, I've moved since to America. I'm, I'm back in, in Miami, uh, mm -hmm. since June. So once, mm -hmm. you know, after pandemic hit El Salvador March, they kind of locked us up, uh, March, April, uh, May, I was over it after three months. I'm very quick at making decisions. Uh, going back to, to our good old professor, uh, to Philly, he said, Fernando, if the dog doesn't bark, shoot it. You know, don't, don't wait too long. Um, Take it so to the back of the barn. <laughs> yeah, just shoot it, you know? So I was like, all right, this is not working. Um, things are not moving in El Salvador. I need to come back to, to America. I got to capitalize once again. I got to build wealth. I got to create my foundations. Um, so I started... Um, a consulting firm with with a guy who used to be my 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 well I used to be his intern seven years ago mm -hmm. here in Miami and you know now we've partnered up in this consulting firm and what we're doing now uh, we're in the food and beverage uh, industries uh, with manufacturers and we help manufacturers enter the U.S. market so we assist from um, you know from the legal requirements that you might need in order to come into America uh, to the identification of an importer who can purchase your products you know, creating the strategy for your marketing, uh, for promotion ads, uh, the pricing that you should have, uh, the different type of bottles, the packagings and everything. So, you know, we're, we're assessing and, you know, my partner has over 30 years of experience in this industry. I personally just have the willingness to keep working and, and you know, and the, the hustle, the sales, the sales. Yeah. Guy. So he, you know, we, we found that match. He was tired. He was like, listen, I'm very well established. I, I have enough to live uh but i keep getting all these clients that want me to bring their because we also have an importer uh well he the, the group has an importer so uh, he's like I, i'm just tired of this right uh but why don't you start taking those clients and whatever you sell uh 
we'll, we'll split. So I was like, all right, sounds wow. like a good deal. Um, <laughs> so we've, you know, we've created this, this company and going back to your, your original question, it took me maybe not even 24 hours. It took me 30 minutes to start a company in America. Right. Um, it took me about a month to start a company in El Salvador and it took me $2,000 to start a company in El Salvador. It took me $0 to start in America. No, I, um, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. That's the problem with our countries making it so complicated for somebody to start, you know, immediately. And then you have one problem and it's, it's, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Fernando, uh, I, I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to call, to talk to us. And I, I also believe that, you know, America is the land of opportunity. I mean, all of our clients are American. I, I always knew that, uh, that I, that if I really wanted to make money, I, it had to be in the U.S. So, so I, I know how hard it is in, in our countries. One, I wanted to ask you, what advice you, would you give a 22-year-old who's just graduating from college and, you know, he's stressed about his first job and, and you that have gone through a lot of stuff after graduation, you know, you started a couple businesses and you're still hustling, what advice would you give them? Try it. You know, just give it a try. I think fear is our worst enemy. Um, most of the time we're always, you know, thinking of what if, what if, what if, and um, we end up growing old, getting comfortable in our position, and we've never tried our dreams out just because fear took over the best of, you know, of our ability. So um, it's hard. I've lost money. I got I to gotta admit it hasn't been a joyful ride. Uh, you are the owner of your own time, but you work twice as much as I would uh, at other jobs. Uh, you are your own boss, but you do have the worst boss of all, which is, you know, that voice in your head that's always nagging you about stuff. Like, you can't really fool yourself, you know? Um, and, you know, there's other kinds of people want to be entrepreneurs because they see a lot of money. And, and I believe there has to be another driving force for that because money is something you will see, but it'll take a while to grow in. Uh, I think that's why even my company, it's called Seed Community. I understand I'm, I'm placing those seeds for my life and, and I won't be able to eat from that fruit until a couple years from now. Oh, so, um, so try it out. I think life is, is full of, you know, of, of opportunities. You have the power to create your own future. Uh, that's something I've, I've always, I, I, I had re read a lot about, uh, you know, the power of manifesting and, putting out what you really wanted. Uh, but if you would have told me two years ago when I started Seed Community or, or over three years now, um, would I have been working with IDB? Would I have been working with the government? Would I be working with all these big corporates? I would have told you that, that, that it was impossible, no right? But, um, you know, I, I think when you put good faith into the universe and you, when you have like you said some you know some passion for what you're doing a purpose of what you're doing and you're and you're creating community around that um i believe the the world has you know some magic to show you so uh feel free to 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 shoot me an email uh and we can stay in touch if anybody wants uh to just you know chat about my experience i'm, I'm always happy to share i think for me the most amazing um, experience has been living living through the eyes of others right when when somebody shares their background it's like oh man I'm doing exactly the same mistake this person did 10 years ago right okay. let me let me change a little bit of direction so uh, find surround yourself with good people that'd be my other uh, best advice that I could give is you know find great people that can help you uh, stay in touch with people that are 10 times more successful than where you are now and and that will permeate that will stick to your body, to your, you know, to your efforts. And I believe that that is the key to success, surrounding yourself with, with people that know a little bit better than, than, than your own. Parents. And that's, 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 that was a great answer. Fernando, I think, uh, I think that's it from my end. I, I want to uh, congratulate you because I, I, I know you're hustling and man, I know you're going to, uh, you're going to do great things for El Salvador and, and for yourself. What a your what's your email so the people that are listening that can reach out to you they they have some questions about about your projects and about what you're working on I'll I'll Perfect. write it down okay I'll write it down in the YouTube link also Perfect but, um, so it's Fernando at seedsv.com okay. um, 
but yeah, feel free to shoot me an email, um, LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can always connect through that means. Uh, and again, I think that, you know, when, when we're starting something new and, and also congratulate you because you are creating your own community, I think it's, it's about adding up all these different pieces that people are doing, connecting with great people. We, you know, it, it maybe if it wasn't because I was doing seed community, we, we, gone by another three years without connecting right we hadn't uh we hadn't connected for 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 a while Danny. so i think at the end it's reaching out to those people that you cross paths um always keeping a tab on what everybody else is you know is kind of working on and, and if you find synergies reach out i think you know you shoot up uh was it a linkedin that, that you sent I, I probably i probably asked a, 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 our mutual friend your whatsapp maybe yeah. Maybe, maybe that or Facebook. I'm, no, I'm it crazy. was Facebook. It was Facebook. Right, I'm still Sarah. the only one who uses Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do too. I'm, I'm not a big fan of social media. So I keep Facebook just to remind me on the birthdays that I have, people have to say hi to. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, very, very grateful for the opportunity. And, you know, I think this is, this is the power of just building upon relationships and connecting with great people that can, you know, give you a little bit of insight on their own journey and, Aren't, aren't we all on borrowed time? So might as well make the best of it. That's awesome, man. We'll, we'll, we'll have a, a beer and a pizza when I go to Miami, okay? <laughs> perfect, perfect. You let me know. Eh? Un cafecito cubano. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you, Fernando. Thank you for your time. I'll, I'll be texting you soon, okay? Perfect. Thank you, Danny.